Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all into this, to this uh, session on precision diagnostics. Uh, please sit so well attended. Um, so, I won't introduce the different speakers in the interest of time because we have a packed program, but I think it's a very exciting program. Um, so, just keeping on then. So, I'm going to talk to you about uh, precision diagnostics primarily in um, hematological uh, malignancies and follow tumors. Uh, and uh, I really wanted to set the scene um, to uh, introduce the, 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 the topics of the, uh, the different speakers uh, that are coming after me um, and give you an overview of what we're currently doing in NHS Diagnostic Lab with me being you know, heading up a, a molecular diagnostic centre here in, in Oxford. So current uh, technologies in the NHS, I'm afraid to say, um, are very much uh, dating um, from you know, almost the last century or so. We're using a variety of different technologies to reveal different genetic abnormalities. And for those who are not geneticists in, in, the, in the audience, um, there are different types of mutations. Sometimes chromosomes are missing. Uh, sometimes um, just base pairs are, uh, are, based, um, are changing. Um, and so we need to reveal all those different um, mutations and abnormalities in patients with, uh, with cancer. And that's becoming increasingly uh, complex and, and uh, complicated. Also, these conventional technologies are, are usually characterized by very poor sensitivity. So when you're talking about clone evolution in tumors or tumor heterogeneity, then very often the technologies are actually not fit for purpose uh, to reveal those uh, subclonal changes. They're quite labor intensive. Uh, they, are, they are very much biased. And, and based on historical observations of what genes mutations are making may be important in, in clinical decision making. And very often they require large amounts of DNA or even live cells. And of course that's quite challenging in a diagnostic environment. Um, the advantage, however, is that they comply with um, regulatory um, uh, standards. And in, in, the, in the UK we're using the, the ISO standard application. <coughs> So in order to get around these, um, these issues, these different technical issues, in the last 20 years or so, labs have invented all sorts of other technologies, and I won't go into details of that, but um, there's an increasing um, problem with training standardization cost of maintenance of, uh, of the equipment. So um, uh, what, what really um, you know, has then become apparent is that maybe with other new technologies, disruptive technologies, uh, such as whole genome sequencing, um, we would be able to you know, throw all these other technologies into the bin, basically start on a blank sheet of paper and start from scratch, because whole genome sequencing at least has the, you know, the, the promise uh, that it might develop into the microscope of the 21st century, in that it reveals all the different types of um, uh, mutations, complex karyotypes, and also will give us an idea of the global changes across uh, the, the cancer genome. So, uh, so how are we going to bring this into healthcare? And this, of course, is a big $10,000 question that Genomics England are asking um, themselves every day of their life uh, since they've come into existence. And here in Oxford, you know, back in 2014, um, uh, when this all started off, we, we essentially, uh, uh, with, help of the, uh, with help of the BRC and also with help of the Health uh, Innovation Challenge Fund, we, we essentially said, okay, how can we do this? How can we, put, how can we introduce this disruptive technology into healthcare? Uh, all the way asking questions on, you know, what do we need to do to consent patients? Uh, how do we need to change the way we're approaching patients for genomic testing? Um, going uh, into pathology and, and um, analyzing how we can change or how we would have to change the way we are dealing with uh, the tissue handling and pre-analytical um, uh, a sampling of, of, uh, of cancer uh, tissue, and then uh, clearly uh, going into the, the bioinformatics, but also, more importantly, the clinical interpretation by um, establishing uh, multidisciplinary tumor boards uh, where, where we discuss patients and results on patients um, individually. So, uh, so the question, the big $10,000 question is then, you know, is there a clinical utility of all of this? And, um, and that's the question remains to be answered in cancer. But I, just to set the scene, I wanted to give you three examples of uh, different uh, patients uh, with cancer. And for the, for, again, for the, the non-genomically uh, savvy people in the audience, I'm trying to be uh, giving you some high-level overview here. So this was a patient, the first patient was a patient presented with um, prostate cancer. Uh, he was initially treated with conventional treatment, but progressed. Um, 
developed uh, metastases in, uh, under the rib cage and he underwent um, a, a biopsy of this uh, tissue to obtain fresh tissue because part of embedded tissue can't be used in this uh, context. And to cut a long story short, with using whole genome sequencing, we identified a um, BRCA signature, BRCA nest signature, that is characterized by very complex uh, mutations um, in a variety of different uh, genes. So not just a single uh, base pair substitution, but, but lots of different changes that you wouldn't really be able to pick up with any of the conventional technologies. So as a consequence of these results, the patient uh, clinician then asked for compassionate use of uh, PARP inhibition, um, because this, uh, this BRCA signature had been uh, just been published as being maybe predictive of response to these new agents, and um, the patient uh, was treated uh, on compassionate use with a, with a PARP inhibitor. So this is an example of how uh, we can reveal complex genomic abnormalities um, and then uh, target those. The next example is, uh, is a different example. This was a 55-year-old woman who presented with a uterine mass. And uh, the, the pathologists, um, both in Oxford and at Harvard in the US, couldn't agree whether this was a high-grade aggressive tumor or whether it was actually uh, more indolent and, and not so aggressive tumor. And that's, that was really important for the, uh, for the patient because it clearly um, dictated what type of treatment the patient would, would receive, which was either hardly any treatment or very aggressive chemotherapy and, and radiotherapy. And so the conventional pathology wasn't very helpful. Uh, the targeted next generation sequencing also wasn't very helpful. And when we then performed whole genome sequencing, we identified what was clearly a hypermutator um, genotype in this patient. And that means that, that, that by simply, and I'm saying simply, counting all the mutations across the genome, we were able to show that this patient had a, um, a, a problem with mismatch repair. So and that's associated with really good prognosis in endometrial cancer. So, so the, after discussion with the, with the multidisciplinary tumor board and then also the patient and the family, uh, the patient decided to go for radiotherapy only and not to have chemotherapy. So this gives you, is an example of you know, how, um, how genome sequencing um, helps us to de-escalate uh, conventional uh, treatment. And then the last example uh, is, a, is an example um, of a patient with a, with a, a cancer of a non-primary where, um, we, where it wasn't clear what actually the underlying um, tissue of origin was. And that's obviously very important when it comes to, treatment, uh, to treating the patient. And uh, this patient turned out to have, a, um, in the end, a uv like signature in the genome. And so clearly the origin of the, of the cancer wasn't the sarcoma that uh, it was originally suggested by the, by the pathologist, but was probably uh, a malignant melanoma. Uh, and so uh, again, highlighting the fact that complex and global mutation signatures in cancer diagnosis are really important. So, so this is an ongoing project and is obviously now being taken on by the 100,000 Genome Program and also remains very involved in, in, um, in trying to make sense out of the genomes. What are the, the, um, the unmet clinical needs in cancer diagnostics? There's still a lot to do around the pre-analytical uh, aspects of it, primarily um, around uh, targeting, <coughs> um, doing deep sequencing to get uh, to go through the tumor heterogeneity, but also using increasingly plasma DNA um, as, as a way of obtaining liquid biopsies from patients who might not be able to undergo invasive uh, 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 investigations. There's, a, there's a, a, a weaknesses around the sequencing performance, both in terms of turnaround time, but then also in terms of actually getting to grips with uh, uh, structural variants, where you often need, need, uh, need long read lengths, um, and also um, understanding private loci uh, more, uh, uh, you know, better. And then there's a, there's a, the, the question around the pathogenicity of variants. <coughs> Um, and uh, more importantly, and I think this is another emerging field, in, is the um, development of uh, deep learning algorithms for image analysis. And um, so I just want to very briefly highlight this in my last couple of slides. So in, in my lab, we've spent a lot of time um, optimizing plasma DNA approaches, uh, both for, um, uh, for cancer diagnostics, uh, but also for prenatal diagnosis. And we have a, um, a patent that is free for license, anybody interested. In, um, in sickle cell um, mutation detection, uh, pre -invasive, non invasively from maternal plasma um, uh, of uh, kids affected with, um, uh, with that, who might be affected by sickle cell disease. 
So uh, we've also spent a lot of time looking at uh, uh, a tumor liquid biopsies. Um, and so these are some initial results from the, um, again, from the 100,000 genome uh, project pilot, where we've uh, looked at uh, um, monitoring patients' um, uh, progress through treatment, uh, and, and in particular before and after surgical treatments uh, in, in, uh, in the plasma. Uh, using both targeted approaches, uh, where we just look at 500 uh, different cancer genes and also whole genome sequencing. And we can identify um, uh, uh, mutations that uh, um, uh, essentially uh, give rise to resistance um, in, in plasma, and we can also identify, again, UV light signatures, smoking signatures from um, plasma. So last but not least, I, I just want to mention very briefly the, um, the, the nanopore technology. Uh, that I think is, is very promising when it comes to um, uh, looking at uh, uh, um, structure variants and uh, long uh, read uh, uh, variants, um, uh, and, and potentially also um, looking at uh, plasma. And so we've got uh, these are some results we have on plasma sequencing and using um, nanopore technology. Uh, a very last word then on, on digital <coughs> images and, and image analysis that I think would be the, la the, the next sort of um, destructive uh, technology on the horizon, uh, where we started to do some work, um, again, using deep learning algorithms to analyze both um, pathology samples that are already stained, um, but then also, um, more recently, some, some work has been published looking at live cells and um, uh, how, how we can identify um, uh, you know, patterns <coughs> of um, uh, abnormal cells in, from, from live cells in, in cancer and how that might predict uh, response to therapy. So in conclusion, um, current conventional diagnostic technologies, I'm afraid, are not fit for purpose for precision medicine. Uh, they, the whole genome sequencing offers the potential to re all, reveal all the different types of mutations, and that's, that's really important in cancer. Um, before we can introduce whole genome sequencing into routine diagnostics, we have to validate it against gold standards, and the, can the cancer analytical pipeline has to be improved. Um, and there are, there's a lot more work that needs to be done primarily around circulating tumor DNA, and then also some of the novel uh, sequencing technologies. Thank you.